Good evening. My name is Danae. I'm one of the elders here at LifePoint, and it is my privilege to welcome you to our first part of a three-part series, Alive. Um, it, it, is, uh, it is no coincidence, nor is it an accident that you're here this evening. We have been praying for you, and it is our hope that as we together um, continue to learn about who Jesus is, what he has done for us in the past, what he is doing for us in the present, and will continue to do in the future, that our lives will be transformed and that we can begin to live like he did. Um, I don't know if you have noticed that on your, on the seats, there is a card. It is a response card. Um, if you turn it around, there's um, some decisions that you can choose. Um, if you want to, at any point during the service tonight, if you would like to fill this out, and um, at the end, we will have we will have a round table, I believe, outside um, with a basket where you can place it. Once again, I'd like to welcome you, and it is my hope that we all feel the presence of the Lord here tonight. Thank you. We're going to begin our service this evening with a time of reflection and praise through song. So I want to invite you to stand and join us. Thank you. 
You may be seated. Creation is searching for meaning, for love, for truth, and for hope. Creation is looking for a Messiah. But our own folly has deceived us and our sin has imprisoned us. We are lost, without hope, and without a future. Surely, we are doomed to live the rest of our lives trapped behind bars of our own making. But God so loved us that he made other plans. Plans for a new future. Behold the Son of God, here to take away the sins of the world. Behold the Son of God, here to release us from our captivity. Behold the Son of God, here to give us new life. Behold the Son of God, here to be our Messiah. So can you see him? No, there we go. <laughs> Let's try that again. All right, good evening. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, if you haven't told someone that's good to see them tonight, can you tap the person on your right or left? Can you give them a smile and say it's good to see you? All right, if you don't have anyone close to you, that's a good sign to get close to someone tonight. Uh, it's good to share spaces together. Tonight we're starting uh, a three-part uh, conversation on what Easter means um, and not the entire of Easter, because Easter is such a depth topic on Jesus and why he died on the cross and, and how he rested and rose. We don't have probably time to unpack all of that. There's so much to unpack there. But at least we're looking at, at what Jesus means to us um, and how Jesus can make us alive. And tonight we're talking a little bit about how God embraces lost causes. How God embraces lost causes. I remember about, I was about six years old. Uh, I had a younger sister who was about three, three and a half at the time, and an older sister who was eight. And we had asked our parents for pets for our entire life, and our parents had always said the same answer. They had always said no. And so we had kept asking because that's what kids do. Kids are resilient, and they'll keep asking until mom and dad give them what they want, except for my kids. And so... Um, we kept asking until finally we, we were moving houses, and the house we moved into not only uh, came with a roof, walls, rooms, bathrooms, kitchen, but it also came with a cat. And we were so excited that the house came with a cat. It was like the best deal that it could ever happen to our family because we had always wanted a pet, and here was this cat. And so my sisters decided to name the cat Michino. It was this black, small cat that was most of the time outside the house, part of the time inside the house. And it was a nice cat. The cat from time to time would wander off into the neighborhood and they would come back on occasion. It would bring back a small snake, a bird, a mouse, you name it. You know, the, ha the, ma <laughs> the cat realized that we were hungry and was bringing food to our house, which was, which was great for us, not for our parents. And, and so we kind of, you know, got 
close to the cat and, and built a relationship with that cat. And slowly my parents started building some sort of affection towards that cat. And I remember it was probably a couple of months later, uh, the cat would go outside, be gone for a couple of hours, sometimes a day or two. And, and this time, a couple of hours went by, a couple of days went by, the cat wasn't coming back. And so my sisters and I got outside of the house and we started walking through the neighborhood. And um, as an adult, I think back, I'm like, that was kind of embarrassing of kind of yelling your pet's name out, but that's what we were doing as kids. We are just screaming out the cat's name, hoping that the cat would run to us. But we didn't knew little about cats because cats don't do that. Um, dogs do that, cats don't do that. Uh, but we still didn't care. We were trying to find our lost cat. And so we, we looked for hours, the sun came down, we went to home, we were sad, uh, kind of cried ourselves to sleep, woke up the next day. As soon as we came back from school, we were outside in the neighborhood again trying to find our cat. And we got bold enough that we started knocking on neighbors' doors hoping that someone found or saw our cat. Now, two, three days go by, you know, I checked out. You know, I tell my sisters, you know, this is a fantastic cause. I encourage you to keep doing it, but I'm out, right? The cat wasn't even that close to me. It scratched me a couple of times. It wasn't even my cat, so go ahead and knock yourself out. My older sister kept up with my younger sister for one more day, but then my younger sister was on her own. And so my older sister and I looked at her and said, Valeria, this is, this is a lost cause. The cat's not coming back. He obviously knows where we live. He doesn't want to come back. Either someone found them, took them in, or someone found them and did some other stuff to the cat, but the cat's not coming back home. And my sister looked at us and, and just started crying because the cat was not lost for her. We just hadn't found it yet. And so for us, it was just, a, 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 you know, a, one more story in your childhood, one more anecdote that you share when you're older. But for her, it meant everything. Like, she didn't get over, I don't know if she's gotten over till today, the fact that that cat didn't come back home. And I look at those situations nowadays a little bit differently, right? There's things in our lives that we call lost causes. We all have uh, some sort of lost cause in our life where we had something that we held dearly, whether it was a, a job, a dream, a house, a car, a pet, something that was close to us. But at some point, we lost it. At some point, it, it, we had to let go. At some point, it drifted away. At some point, we had no control. And, and that thing that we love so much is lost. And, and when it applies to human beings, it's a little bit differently because there's some human beings that we kind of title as lost causes, right? I don't need to explain to you too much about what that means because we have people in our families or in our circles or friends or in our workspace. We have people in our communities that we kind of title lost causes. When we try to help someone that's in the same situation over and over again, we might not say it out loud, but there's something inside of us that almost feels like it's a lost cause question is, is what do we do when we're dealing with, with lost causes, whether it's a personal failure, whether we didn't meet the standard we had for ourselves or the standard that someone had for us or the standard that our boss, boss had for us or the standard that our spouse had for us? Like, what do we do? Where do we go when we have those personal failures and we feel like that lost cause? Or what do we do in, in, in when relationships break, whether it's a marriage or whether it's a relationship with a sibling or with a son or with a parent or with an uncle or aunt? What do we do when those relationships break? When we've tried over and over to patch things up, when we've gone the extra mile, when we've listened all that we could listen, when we've, you know, asked for forgiveness and it still seems like we're going in the same cycle. What do we do with those lost causes in relationships? Maybe your lost cause is, is with an addiction, with something that you set out early this year to say, this year, I'm giving that up. This year, I'm letting that go. This year, I'm getting in shape. This year, I'm eating better. This year, I'm spending less time on my phone. Like, what do we do when we find ourselves back in the same cycle? I don't know about you, but many times for me, I look in the mirror and I'm like, I'm a lost cause in that area. Like there's no hope for me to change or grow or get better or improve. There's no hope for me in terms of how I can overcome this situation or this challenge or this thing that's close to my heart. Maybe the lost cause is not internal or external as you look at people in the community. 
as you look at the politics in our country and world, as you see things shifting and moving, maybe you're saying, you know, society is a lost cause or our country is a lost cause or the world is a lost cause because of A, B, C. And I think it kind of rebounds back to our own mental health where we are triggered by the past, present, and future, by smells and situations, by traffic, by by music, by all sorts of scenarios, and at times we fall in the traps of anxiety or depression or sadness or just anger, and it seems like we can never let go. The thing I love about Easter is that I'm reminded that we have a God who doesn't give up on any lost cause. Where we have a God who doesn't give up on any individual, any circumstance, any scenario, any sin that kind of entraps our heart. As a matter of the fact, the Bible is full of stories of God coming after lost causes. We have the story in the book of Genesis where God saw a lost situation. When he told his creation, Adam and Eve, he's like, you can do everything. 99.9% of this garden is yours. You can touch, you can eat, you can live, you can name the animals, they're yours. You can can do what you want, just don't touch that one. Like don't get close to it, don't eat it, don't allow yourselves to be entrapped by it. And and if you do happen to do that, then, 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 then you'll be lost. But it's interesting that the moment that they did what they were not supposed to do, the, only, the one rule they were not supposed to break, the one tree that they were not supposed to eat from, the one situation, it was very simple, very easy, but yet they messed up and they were lost. They kind of pointed the finger at each other saying, it's your fault, no, it's your fault, no, it's the serpent's fault. And they're trying to cover themselves because they feel shame and guilt. They feel lost. And Adam and Eve, for the first time, feel like a lost cause, like they let themselves down, they left God down, they let creation down. I don't know what they felt, but it must have been devastating to at one moment be running to God in a garden, and this moment they're running away from God. And I'm sure they wanted to just allow like the earth to eat them up and hide them, but God found them. And God could have pointed out their mistake. He could have sermonized and lectured. He could have told them how much and how deeply they had hurt him in the entire universe, but God didn't do that. You see, God loves lost causes. And in that moment of being lost and confused, in that moment of feeling shame and guilt, in their worst moment, God made the biggest promise that the universe has ever heard and ever seen. God says, I will give up my, law, my son for him to become a lost cause so that you can be found. Maybe you came tonight or maybe you're watching tonight and you're feeling that you're a lost cause. You're feeling that this year's not going the way you wanted it to. You're feeling that your relationships are not where they need to be. You're feeling the effects of sin in your heart and life. You're dealing with maybe a challenges of, of past, present, and the fear of the future. Maybe you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, I'm not good enough, or you don't feel like you're smart enough or tall enough or beautiful enough. And tonight, God wants to tell you that you are enough. You're enough for him and you're enough for his son. You're enough for the Holy Spirit to be touching and moving your heart tonight. And so we have a a son, God's son that came to earth to just show how much he loves lost causes. I'm not going to go into detail into these stories, but if you have your, your, your phone or your Bible, you can open them up. We're going to John chapter 3. There's an interesting story there. I know you know John chapter 3, verse 16. We're going to jump to the beginning of John chapter 3. There's a story there about a man that wanted to know more about his Jesus. Um, and it's probably one of the only times in the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where there's a man called a Pharisee. That's what he did. But we, when we hear the word Pharisee, it's almost like who he is, right? It's almost like a character trait. There's a Pharisee that wants to come close to Jesus, not to entrap Jesus, not to point out where Jesus has messed up or how bad Jesus is, but this Pharisee wants to talk to Jesus. 
This Pharisee wants to learn from Jesus. This Pharisee not only wants to learn and be close to Jesus, but this Pharisee is needing something deeper that, that, he's, that he feels missing in his life. And so he comes to Jesus, and it's interesting, you might have heard the story, that he doesn't come to Jesus in the daytime. He comes to Jesus at nighttime. And one important thing to highlight about this story is that during Jesus' time, there was no light post in the street. There was no lights on the highways or roads. There was no, you know, lights outside people's homes. Once the sun went down, people went down too. They went to sleep. And so when Nicodemus left his house that night, he left with the intent of no one seeing him or no one seeing him with Jesus that night because he was a little concerned at that point in how people might see him if they might see him with Jesus. And so he reaches Jesus and he sits down with Jesus and he starts having this conversation with Jesus. He's alone with Jesus, no disciples, no distractions, no sick people, no people wanting to see Jesus or talk to Jesus, no children running up to Jesus, no fellow Pharisees trying to throw tough questions at Jesus. So he comes to Jesus and he says, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with them. Verse 3 says, very truly, I tell you, said Jesus, no one can see the kingdom unless they are born again. Nicodemus says, well, how can someone be born again if they're old? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born again. Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. You should not be surprised at my sayings. You must be born again. Then the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus is confused, so he says, how can this be? You are Israel's teachers, Jesus says, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you to unearthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? It's almost an embarrassing conversation that's documented on Nicodemus' part, right? I don't know if Nicodemus either told this story to John or if Jesus told the story to John, or if God revealed the story to John, what we do is that his story, his story is documented and we have the full-blown verbatim conversation that Jesus has with this man. A man that's supposed to know scripture from beginning to end, a man who's supposed to memorize scripture, a man who's supposed to teach scripture, a man who was in front of a congregation multiple times, a man who had visited people in the hospital or in homes, a man who was trusted and looked up to, but yet, although he has lived a religious life all of his life, the entire life, although he had done it to a certain degree and perfection, yet still he's lacking something. He has knowledge, but he has no substance. He, he has words, but he has no meaning. He, he knows of God, but doesn't have a relationship with God. He's a good church attender, but he does not follow Jesus. And so he's come to Jesus wanting to know more and without him even asking a question about what the deep longings of his heart are, Jesus could see right through him and Jesus knows that although he's in the church, he's lost. Jesus knows all the times that Nicodemus woke up in the morning and did not feel good about himself. Jesus knows all the times that Nicodemus taught the word but wasn't really believing it. Jesus knows of all the crisis that Nicodemus went through and had major doubts about God and major doubts about his religion and major doubts about who he was and who has, he was becoming. And so it's interesting that Jesus doesn't start with the basics of the Bible. He starts with the basics of learning to be a follower of Jesus. He says, you, you have a PhD, but let me start you way over here and learning to trust me with your heart learning to trust me with your life, learning to trust me with your reputation, learning to trust me with your finances. You see, although Nicodemus was a wealthy man and a respectable man, he was a lost cause. 
He had all the exterior things right, but inside he was falling apart. Inside he was empty. Inside he was longing. And so Jesus shares the most beautiful thing that, any, that Jesus could share with anyone. In other words, he kind of tells them, you're not a lost cause because you can be reborn. You feel like you're dying right now, but I can bring life into your heart. You feel that you have no meaning, but I can bring true purpose. You, you believe you have knowledge, but I can bring wisdom. Maybe you're like Nicodemus tonight where you've been coming to church for a long time or you've been a Christian for a long time, you've been a believer for a long time, but you still feel lost inside. You've been going through all the right actions, you've been a part of a church or going to a church, serving at a church, but you still feel something missing inside. It's a good opportunity tonight to pay attention to Jesus' words where he says, uh, verse 14, just as Moses lifted up a snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man will be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life. Everyone. Nicodemus, this message is, is for you. You're a lost cause, but it's not just for you. It's for the rest of the Pharisees, the rest of the scribes, everyone that works in the temple. Nicodemus, this message is for your family. This message is for that cousin that keeps messing up. This message is for your mother-in-law. This message is for your kids. This message is for that neighbor that you don't get along with. This message is for that person that you've been evading your entire life. This, person, this message is for those people on the streets. This message is for everyone, Nicodemus. It's that everyone that believes may have eternal life. So Nicodemus, do you believe? Do you believe that you can be reborn? Do you re believe that I can do all the wrong that's in your life? Do you believe that I can bring life into your heart today? And Jesus then goes into the words that probably have been the most repeated in all of human history. Verse 16, where he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. I wonder what Nicodemus felt in that moment. I wonder if he's feeling shame because he's being outed of, as an unbeliever, although he thinks he's a believer. I'm wondering if, if he feels so small next to Jesus, who's breaking down Scripture in such a powerful way, in a way he's never heard it his entire life, although he's taught it hundreds of times. I, wonder, I was wondering if, if he's feeling exposed and almost feeling glad that he came at night and no one else is hearing this conversation and no one else is documenting of how poor a follower he is. If we were to wrap up the story right now with Nicodemus, we would say Nicodemus, the lost cause, who did not believe in Jesus, who had doubts that Jesus could be, uh, he, that he needed to be reborn, that he was thinking outside of spiritual realms and in human realms, that he was just making Jesus' words impossible instead of allowing the Spirit to make the impossible possible. I wonder how many times we find ourselves in these situations that we, we, we call ourselves Christians, we want to be Christians, but yet in the moments of confusion, doubts, and crisis, we doubt. We say we believe, but when we're lacking, we doubt that we don't know where it's going to come from. And moments of tension and relationship, we want them to get better on our terms, but we're not trusting God to heal in his terms. So many times we get mad at God and many times we get frustrated with God. Many times we, you know, shake our fist at God and say, where are you? Why weren't you there when I needed you? Why weren't you there when I was going through the crisis in times of need? Why weren't you there when people were suffering? Why weren't you there when there was wars and confusions and conflict? It's a pivotal moment in Nicodemus' life because he has a choice to make. And any time that we are sitting face to face with Jesus, it's a pivotal point in our lives. Because when Jesus is in front of you and Jesus is confronting you and Jesus is sharing his words with you, there's only two outcomes. We either say yes and we choose to believe, we choose to surrender and follow him, or we reject the invitation and walk away. I believe for the first time Nicodemus is having to make this type of decision. He's come to Jesus, and Jesus has laid it out, and now he has to make a choice. Do I want to continue in being a lost cause? 
Do I want to throw pity parties for myself and say how bad life and others have treated me? Or do I want to embrace this fountain of life, hope, and forgiveness right now? I believe every day we have that opportunity. Every day we have that invitation. We're not lost causes. Because God is constantly trying to find, to save, to redeem, to bring close to him. Verse 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What if God was trying to save you tonight? What if God was trying to save you right now? What if God was trying to save you from the circumstance, from the scenario? What if God was trying to save you from the relationship? What if God was trying to save you from yourself? What if tonight all you needed to step into that realm of trusting God and, and having God create that new life, what if it, all it took was just to believe? What if all it took is say, Jesus, I want to believe, so help my unbelief. <laughs> what if Jesus was waiting on our response to his invitation? You don't need to continue to feel like a lost cause or talk like a lost cause or think like a lost cause. Today, you can invite Jesus into your heart and be found. There's a second story that's kind of in contrast to this story. It's found in uh, John chapter 8. If you have your Bible, you can quickly turn to it. It's a story about one day Jesus teaching in a big crowd. He has his disciples close by and a larger crowd hanging out. Jesus is having the time of his life. He loved being with people. And although Jesus was nothing like the people that were close to him, Jesus loved them, and they loved Jesus back. And this day, Jesus is teaching, he is deep in the word, and all of a sudden, there's a big interruption, big group of Pharisees coming through, and they got someone, they're dragging in between the group, and they make it all their way to where Jesus is, and, and, and as they open up, the people could see, and Jesus could see, the disciples could see, that there's this woman that has barely any clothes on her that gets dropped in front of Jesus. They kind of pick her up, and they look at Jesus, say, Jesus, what are we to do with this woman? She's been caught in the act of adultery. She's been, you know, in relations with a man that's not her husband. So what should we do? The law of Moses says to stone her, but what do you say? In other words, they found someone that they had already had title as a lost cause. Most likely, this was not the first time that this lady finds herself in this situation. She was well known to kind of live in this world and give her body away. And so they knew who she was. The church had the responsibility to love her, redeem her, and bring her back to God, but all the church had done is given her a title. She's a lost cause. And I don't know, and I hope that Nicodemus wasn't part of that group of disciples, of Pharisees that walked up with this woman and threw her in front of Jesus, but it was his crowd, it was his group that did this. And so Jesus kind of looks at the woman and Jesus looks at the Pharisees and he, Jesus looks at his disciples. And Jesus can see something that no one else could see. While everyone in that crowd that day could see the woman and could see that she barely had clothes on herself, I imagine that people in the crowd would say, Wait, what? why is this woman here? Why have they brought her here? Oh, why this woman again doing this thing? We've told her hundreds of times not to do that. We've told her to repent. We've told her what to do. We've given her Bibles. We've given her material to get better and to get help. Why is she ruining our day? This was our moment with Jesus. I can imagine some other people in the crowd saying some names or, or saying the despicable things about this woman and maybe not saying them out loud, but thinking them in their hearts. And I believe everyone in that crowd is tearing this woman apart. And Jesus could see that. And I don't think that Jesus is only hurt because the woman is on the floor half clothed and caught in the act. But I think Jesus is hurting because he can see this lost cause that's obvious on the floor, but he can see all the lost causes in that room, in that space that day. She was the most obvious one, but everyone was lost. Everyone was being a hypocrite. Everyone had hidden sins. Everyone had hidden agendas. No one had a pure heart. 
And while everyone that day except the woman felt better about themselves because they were not in the act of adultery and they hadn't committed that sin, they hadn't broke the Ten Commandments, they hadn't sinned against God, they hadn't brought shame, shame about themselves and everyone else, they felt a little bit better, they had a little bit higher ground, a little bit moral ground, more ethics, they were a little bit cleaner. But I believe everyone inside was just as dirty as her. She might have been the only honest one in that space that day, acknowledging that she was a sinner and needed of God's grace. And I don't know how much she knows about Jesus or how much she knows about who Jesus is. I don't know if she knows that Jesus came to this world to save lost causes like her. I don't know if she knows that she has the best person in her corner that day. <laughs> That she has the undisputed uh, best boxer of all time kind of fight for her. She, I don't know if she knows all that. Because the moment that Jesus comes close to her, she doesn't even have the courage to look up to him. She's flooded with guilt and shame, and she can't even bring her eyes off the floor because she knows what she's done. She knows who she is. And in that moment, she's like, I don't deserve anything. I'm a lost cause. I don't deserve to be here. I deserve to be killed. Maybe she's waiting for that first stone to hit her on the head and knock her unconscious. But then Jesus does something that's hard to describe, right? He doesn't say a word. He didn't say, he didn't do much. He's kind of there where he is, he just starts doodling on the sand. And all we know is the effects of what he writes. We don't know what he wrote. We just know what happened. But as some of those men that had brought this woman start looking at what Jesus is writing, they see some stuff on the sand that makes them feel now like a lost cause. They, they start feeling some shame because they realize that, that they also have some things in their hearts that need to be changed. They all have some, some addictions that they need to go of. They also have some issues to be dealt with. And it says that one by one, they start dropping those stones and they start walking away. And soon everyone that's accused her, everyone that, that's torn her down, everyone that's ruined her reputation, everyone that's called her a lost cause, not one is there, not one is standing. And so Jesus looks at her and he begins this process of redeeming her and he says, where are those where are those crazy men that were accusing you? Where are, the, where, where are the ones that wanted to kill you? And maybe that's the point where she finally lifts up her eyes and she doesn't see anyone. The people that she feared are gone. The people that had caused her to feel anxiety and fear and, and this tremendous desire to, to save her life somehow are no longer there. And in that moment, she begins to feel a little bit of peace inside her heart, a little bit of relief. And in that moment, she doesn't feel that lost. And being in proximity with Jesus, she's like, the way this man looks at me, it seems like he cares. It seems like he's different. I feel he can see everything inside of me. He knows all the bad things I've done, yet he's not angry. He's not saying bad things. He's not holding a stone in his hand. Jesus slowly picks her up and he tells her, go and sin no more. I sometimes imagine, you know, how everyone went home that day. <laughs> this lady that was thrown on the ground didn't think she was going to make it home. The Pharisees who had left home thinking that they were going to finally trap Jesus and kill a human being in the process. I'm sure they didn't sleep last night, that night, because there was things in their heart that were not dealt with, and their pride was eating them up from the inside out. No peace. Maybe anger, and maybe more plans, more desires, maybe more conversations about how to kill this man named Jesus. The crowd that day probably was astonished because no one had ever done this before. I imagine people texting and posting. You won't believe what happened. 
Uh, there, was a, there was supposed to be a stoning, but, but Jesus started writing some stuff, and, and the stoners ran away. <laughs> Like, Jesus was able to push the bullies away. Jesus was able to push the law away. Jesus was able to push the angry people away. Jesus was able to put the religious people away. Like, Jesus is insane. We can't believe what he's done. We, we want to be with him more. We want to hear from him. We want to see what he does next. And maybe the disciples were the most confused of the whole bunch. Because <laughs> they went home with Jesus that night. And they know that their teachers, their Sabbath school teachers, their pastors, their elders were the ones that wanted to stone the woman, and now Jesus stopped it. And, and those men are angry with Jesus, therefore those men are angry with them, so they're a little bit confused. They love what Jesus has done, but they don't love what Jesus has done. But the woman, right? Do you imagine what the woman felt that night when she went home? I don't know if she was able to eat a, a meal because maybe she's so excited. Or maybe it's just the tears flowing from her eyes because the first time in her life that she's seen, that she's heard, that she's understood. I, I don't know if she sleeps that night because she lays in her bed and all she can see is Jesus' face looking at her, not condemning her, but picking her up. How this man named Jesus stepped in that day and became her hero, not just her hero, her superhero. And she begins to maybe dream and picture her life a little bit differently. Maybe she begins to see her life outside of this pattern of sin and addiction and confusion and entrapment. And she says, maybe there's a different present and future for me. Different, maybe there's a different life for me. Maybe God has a purpose for my life. Maybe I'm not lost after all. Maybe all the people were wrong and what he says is true. And I think for the first time, that woman felt what it feels to be alive in Jesus. A new identity, a new purpose, a new direction, a fresh start. And knowing her past, but now saying, if, if Jesus forgave me of my past, why am I going to worry about my past and letting go of the past? And maybe he's saying, God, if you were able to do that, what are you going to do next in my life? I hope that Nicodemus was there that day. Not as a man who brought this woman down and wanted Jesus to stone her, but as a bystander, as an observer, as a learner of Jesus. Because I think if Nicodemus would have heard Jesus' first conversation and would have seen Jesus in action, those two things would have become one. And he would have thought, if Jesus had told me I can be reborn again and have a new life, but yet he told this woman who was lost, who was deep in sin, this woman that, that the temple would have never accepted or society accepted, yet he accepted her, that he can do the impossible. If he can deal with her sin, he can deal with my sin. If he can deal with her confusion, he can deal with mine. If he can deal with her status, he can deal with mine, and there's hope. And maybe that's what Easter is all about. And remembering that Jesus paid the price, not just for the world, but for me. That while I may think sometimes that I'm the one that, that's saving the woman, I'm the Jesus, or we may think, you know, we're the disciples of Jesus. We're close by, we're not doing the saving, but we're close by. <laughs> Yet sometimes we're the Pharisees and we're bringing other people down and throwing them down and labeling them and giving them certain sins that belong to them. Or maybe you're part of the crowd and you're observing, but not yet part directly of the story. Today, I want you to put yourself in the place of Nicodemus or in the place of the woman. If you feel that you're in the church, but yet you're lacking meaning and purpose, then Jesus is inviting you tonight to give him your heart, to be reborn, to have a new life, to start with him and depend on things for all things, not just to submit your heart, but submit everything to him. Maybe tonight you're siding more with a woman and saying, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. 
I haven't done the, the things the way that God has wanted me. I've disobeyed. I've gone out of the path. I've gone out of God's will. Yet God today is coming close to you and picking you up by the hand or picking you up by the shoulder. And he's telling you that he loves you. He's telling you that he has a plan and purpose for your life. He's telling you that he can forgive any sin that's confessed if you're willing to let go. So maybe tonight's an opportunity to receive that hope that only comes in allowing Jesus to give us faith in him. Maybe it's an opportunity to allow Jesus to redo our identity. And wherever the devil or ourselves or the world has titled us as lost causes, we can look at them and say, we're not lost, we're found. We're not alone because Jesus is with us. We, we have not failed because Jesus never failed. And although at times we may not be faithful, he never, ever abandons you. Tonight you have an opportunity to respond to the message that God has for you tonight. You have a card uh, maybe on your seat or the seat next to you, or the, freedom, the seat in front of you. And I just want to give you a moment to look at that card and fill it out tonight. Maybe tonight you just need to recommit your life to Jesus and you can check that box. Maybe you're needing tonight for one of the elders or myself to give you a phone call or a visit, to have a conversation. Maybe you're here tonight and you haven't been baptized and you need to give your life to Jesus and you can check that box. Or maybe there's something else that you just need prayer for, you need help for, that you just need someone else to know about. So I'll give you a minute to fill that card on our way out tonight. There'll be a table in the lobby where you can drop that card off. I'm going to make sure to read those cards tonight and pray over those cards and contact you tomorrow. But I just want to give you a moment to make a decision. Because just like Nicodemus made a decision and this woman made a decision, we have to make a decision. Are we going to allow the world, the devil, ourselves to treat us like a lost cause, to think of us like a lost cause, to type like a lost cause, live like a lost cause? Or will we, or will we allow Jesus tonight to find us, to pick us up, and to give us a fresh start. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father who art in heaven, we thank you so much that you're a God that loves lost causes. That when we are in our worst state, worst scenario, worst crisis, worst sin, you're right there next to us willing to pick us up. We thank you, Father, that you not only pick us up, but you're willing to give us a new life. You're willing to give us a fresh start. You're willing to forgive us of our sins. You're willing to give us this clear purpose and direction for our lives. And you remind us that this message is not just for us, Father. You remind us that this message is for the entire world. Because you don't want to condemn the world as a lost world or lost causes, but you want to find the lost sheep, the lost coin. You want to come looking for the lost son. Father, today we want to be found. We want to be brought close to you and live in your presence. So help us today to surrender. Help us today to surrender that false identity. Help us today to surrender that sin. Help us today to surrender the situation, the scenario, the circumstance. Help us today to su surrender the relationship, the marriage, the family, the home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We want to thank you so much for coming tonight. If you would like a prayer tonight, you can just uh, come find me up front. I would love to pray for you if, if that's what you need tonight or have a conversation. Um, if not, you can, you're welcome to hang around for a little bit. You're welcome to come back tomorrow night, same time, same place. Tomorrow night, um, we're going to have a special message, and also uh, we're going to be sharing time together, doing communion and sharing of Jesus' body um, and what he laid down for us at the cross. So come prepare tomorrow night to be able to participate directly in communion, but also continue to hear God's word. May God bless you.